All right. So anyway, I'm, I'm going to start out by giving you two very, very general definitions of social justice and the common good. And I'll try my best to weave in some personal stories throughout. Okay? Social justice is a very broad field, obviously. Um, it's, if you want to call it a subdivision of moral theology, which is a subdivision of general theology. They're all interrelated. We divide them maybe to study them, but they're also interrelated. Uh, beyond sexual ethics, this would be the other expertise in moral theology of mine. You can't pick everything. Uh, I love social justice and um, studying it. All right, so let's define it as providing the conditions to allow all to obtain what is their due, D-U-E. To allow all to obtain what is their due according to their nature and vocation, okay? So it's providing the conditions that allow all to obtain what is their due according to their nature and their vocations. So there's, a, there's an element of flourishing here that we're concerned with. Yes, sir? What do you mean by nature and vocation? Well, we're going to look at the nature of the human person, and we all have different skills and abilities in the world, right? So. Some people's skills are just more marketable than others. Some people's skills are much more um, evidenced in helping others. That, you know, so we're going to have to keep this in. The term that's going to help us understand this a little better is the word solidarity, which we're going to define in a little bit. But it's just nature. I'm talking about human nature and vocation. It's what our callings are in life. Not just marriage and priesthood, religious life, but whatever particular vocation. All right. So no matter what we go into, I don't care if you go into welding, if you go into social work, if you go in to be, uh, get an MBA, you know, this is concerned with how do you flourish according to the human person in those fields and in the world, right? I know it's very general, but by the way, this when, when we were holy name, this was a course, okay? So I'm giving you the, uh, the highlights of a course in three days. Um, and that course probably was just a section of what I would have learned in my studies, right? So it's going to be hard to make sense for this to everybody. The reason why this is so important is because how we approach justice, which who does not want justice on economic levels, international levels, racial levels, you know, you name it. We all want justice in this regard. So the fact that we are searching for this justice in our world becomes itself an instrument of evangelization. Right, so this is how we say um, what our God is to us. It's how we live. <coughs> Bless you. Um, not to sound like a, like a cheerleader for the Catholic Church, but even my Protestant minister friends will self-admit, and so does the literature, the Catholic Church is, is just light years ahead of other denominations. The Catholic Church came out with uh, social justice theories from the latter part of the 19th century. It took a lot of other denominations in the 1970s, so they started catching up. All right. And when they did start catching up, they almost were like social gospel. You know, in other words, it's more important feeding the poor than it is, you know, worrying about our relationship with God. Like that was the relationship alone. You know, so and which you see a lot of evangelicals were actually a resistance against what they called the social um, justice movement within the church. Now, if you listen to the news, social justice will have a different definition, and it's usually not um, very good. It usually um, means just giving people, you know, they almost equate it with communism giving everybody um, the same. But we'll see that that's not the case. All right, so another very important term is common good. In other words, if we're not working towards a good that is common amongst all of us and good for all of us, what sense do we have? We'll have to make arguments later maybe what that good is. But nonetheless, we'll define the common good as the sum, of to the sum total of social conditions which allow people to reach their fulfillment more fully and easily, all right? The sum total of social conditions which allow people to reach their fulfillment more fully and easily, all right? So if a government is supposed to work towards the common good, then the government has to have things in place that allow us, whatever we're called to do, that we can flourish in that occupation. We can flourish in our lives as family members you know, they have, they have to have something that they can help us do that more easily, all right? Now, again, I understand that's a very, very general um, description. You don't even need to write this. It's just redundant. This, too, if we know what the common good is and work towards it, 
this too becomes an instrument of, of evangelization for our salvation. Now, this does not mean that we could not flourish and even be free in a very hostile environment, right? So, you know, Alexander Solzhenitsyn would, you know, was in the gulags for a while where you have no personal freedoms, and yet he still came out of that with his dignity intact. If you want a fictional account, um, The Shoes of the Fisherman, which came out in a book written in the 60s, and actually the, the movie came out in the 60s, early 70s, which ironically was about um, a, a, a Euro, an Eastern European becoming a pope, which you know ironically happened about a decade later. But that particular pope, he was Russian, and he was in the slave labor camps because it was, he was a priest who was made bishop while he was in there. And when he came out, the Kremlin asked him, would you want to be free? And he said, um, I've been free for quite some time, right? So it isn't that, you know, you can't flourish no matter where we're at, but the common good, people who seek the common good will help us do that more easily, um, okay? Now, I want to talk to you, this is known as like the triangle. It's the relationship between individuals and society. So when you see an arrow pointing from individuals to society, the idea is, is we're talking about the relationship that we all have individually to the society as a whole, okay? That is known as legal justice, all right? So the most clear example that we can give is that we pay taxes, right? We contribute to society, so society can use that for the common good. Let's not argue about whether or not that's being done efficiently. That's a separate argument. We're just saying that do we have some obligation to contribute to society? I mean, we could go back to Jesus when he was shown the coin with Caesar's um, you know, face on it, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, okay? So that's what we're talking about here. This is known as legal justice. There's also a responsibility that society as a whole has to each individual. That is known as distributive justice. So we can think in terms here of benefits, right? So these are, you know, perhaps uh, unemployment insurance, um, the safety nets of welfare, uh, pharmaceutical uh, regulation. So what you, if you really want it down into one word, legal justice has to do with the burdens that each of us share for the whole. And distributive justice has to do with the benefits that the whole owes to each individual. So this, so social justice is regulating these burdens and benefits, right? Now, the relationship between individuals has a name also. It's called commutative justice. But we're not going to be interested in that here. Okay, and I'll tell you why in a sec. This would be like contracts. You want to sell your house, you hire an agent who represents you, and he sells your house to another agent who represents somebody else. That's not really a social justice concern. If you want to hire the neighborhood kid to mow your lawn, you're going to give him 25 bucks. That's between the two of you. All right? So that's the relationship between individuals. It's typically, you know, found in the form of contracts, whether they be a handshake, an agreement, or something formal. But that's not necessarily what we're concerned about here. So social justice does not include communicative justice, all right? So when we talk about social justice, we are only talking about the burdens and the benefits from individuals to society and from society to individuals. So social justice does not include communicative justice, but it's obviously related, okay? We're not saying it has nothing to do with it, right? because we could probably come up with some sort of fanciful situation where a kid winds up, you know, taking over a monopoly of his neighborhood and somebody's got to step in and say, okay, no, 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 you know, this is getting out of hand, you know, that kind of thing. But it really, it has nothing to do with this. This is what individuals, you know, have to do. When I was a kid, I was quite entrepreneurial because I had no money, right? So I set up lemonade stands. Now, there was a big forge complex near me. So like the guy's coming out of the forge complex, I could sell something for a quarter. But there was three entrances. Why not have three lemonade stands? Oh, you're a genius. So I got two other kids to do it, and I said, oh, you keep half of whatever you make, right? That lasted for a summer. It was a beautiful summer. <laughs> anyway, um, so any questions on this slide? It's pretty straightforward, all right? And again, I know there's a lot that we can go on about this. So um, as I usually say, you're hearing the end argument, not the explanation. All right, this is a pillar, 
an absolute pillar in social justice. This and subsidiarity, which you'll learn tomorrow. So if you ever hear me talk about what would be a pillar of social justice theory, it's, subsidi it's solidarity. So solidarity is an interdependence. You know, it's not just that we're connected. Me and you are dependent on each other, and that's a good thing. It's an interdependence grounded on the principle that the goods of creation were meant for all, all right? It's an interdependence grounded on the principle that all the goods of creation were meant for all. So if somebody hoards a particular resource, whether it be a country or a state, and oftentimes we use those to mean the same thing, or an individual, it's not really always right. Now, what would be a sense of solidarity, right? Because we live in, we don't live in a laissez-faire capitalism, but we live in a, in a pretty well-defined market economy where pro it's profit-driven. But um, the guy who had the cure for polio, he sought no patent on it because he thought, you know, the only way to keep his cost down and get other people to find out how to make this cheap is to put no patent on it. Now, that guy could have been a millionaire, easily, easily. But you notice how he recognized the solidarity. So the goods of the earth were meant for all, and that included his own talents. You know? You'll see as we move along here why I think my journal is one of the more important things we do. Because if you aren't going to transform yourself personally, we're all screwed. End of story. There's no way, you, the government, I mean, I don't care what you thought about Barack Obama, and I don't care what you think about Donald Trump. They are extremely limited on what they can do. We are not. We could change our entire neighborhoods. We just choose not to because so often we want other people to do it rather than self-transformation. So we'll talk more about that in a second. So how is solidarity manifested into our world? Well, because it has to do with, you know, from the individual to the whole and the whole to the individual, it's manifested by the distribution of goods. Like, how do these things get distributed among us? And that is passing the spell, remuneration. It's not remuneration, <coughs> remuneration, it's remuneration, right? In other words, you're getting money. So this has to do with remuneration for work. You're getting paid for your work. So how are goods distributed and how do you get paid for your work? Is it fair? This is how solidarity is manifested. It's also how solidarity breaks down. And this is not communism, all right? You're going to find the Catholic Church sits right in the center on most of these issues. You can be a Republican, an Independent, a Libertarian, and a Democrat, and be a good Catholic. You could not be a good Catholic and accept those party platforms 100%. I don't know how you can do that. I don't care which party platform. I'll give you a for instance. The Catholic Church, and, I, and this, all this stuff is an opinion. It's, it's not just my opinion. It's the opinion of social justice theorists because the Catholic Church is never going to pronounce on this stuff. This is not pronounceable stuff, right? The Catholic Church is not a big fan of trickle-down economics. What is trickle-down economics? You have the money and the tax breaks to the rich. They will then invest it in businesses, and eventually that will find its way down into the pockets of, of um, lower um, people on the rungs. They don't have a problem with it in principle. <laughs> it's not like there's something inherently wrong with doing that. It just doesn't work. The rich wind up getting richer, right? On the, now, if, right there, you're thinking, well, okay, that's, that's against the Republican Party, so that sounds like a Democratic position. You're right. But on the other hand, they're also very much against the welfare society. They're not against you receiving benefits for when you are left out of your job, or if you simply can't afford to live, but there's not some safety net. Um, but they're also very much against you being on that for any length of time, because it'll sap, they'll say it saps your energies. And if you have two, three generations, that's a huge problem. That's a systematic problem within the end. So that sounds like a Republican stand, right? So they're in between on that. You have to have something there, but it just can't, you know, it has to only get them over the hump. And you just can't give the rich the money expecting that they're going to invest in their business and somehow the, the people on the lower rung are going to get it, right? So what would, they, what would they like? Well, in my town, Adamstown, we have the largest hat factory in the United States. It's employee-owned. How great would that be? So if you're an employee there, and your work hard, you see your investment, not just in your company growing, but what you get out of that. You get something out of that. Um, ben and Jerry, who no longer own Ben and Jerry's. But when they did own Ben and Jerry's, I don't know how it is now, they made a pledge that, that the lowest paid employee, the guy who sweeps the floor in the middle of the night, 
the day will never make more than nine times what that person makes. So if they if they want to make a million dollars, then they got to bring that guy up. That's that's solidarity, right? So the problem is is when we go after profit for its own sake, right? And profit's not bad. It's all what you do with it. And I'll explain that in a little bit. All right. And by the way, just wage and fair wage we'll talk about tomorrow. So we're not going to talk about that today. So th these are really. I guess I can give you instances, and maybe I shouldn't have got ahead of myself with my descriptions. There has to be solidarity amongst the poor, all right? So even the poor can help each other. Okay, so I grew up in a poor neighborhood. I've already shared with you that. I'm not ashamed. My dad was on disability. Never went on a single vacation. Never went on a day trip. Never went out to eat but twice until I graduated high school. Um, but all my friends were in the same boat. <laughs> so with no sense complaining. They had to tell you to shut up. I'm in the same boat. So there had to be a solidarity, like how do we help each other? So what do people do? They share vegetables. My dad, we built a little greenhouse, we had a huge garden, he gave the vegetables. My dad was the only living guy on our block, everybody else was widowed. So he, um, that was his way, right? You can still have solidarity with people who don't have a lot of money. And by the way, when I say poor, I'm not talking destitute. We'll talk about that tomorrow too. There has to be solidarity between the rich and the poor. So the good cardinal from a few years ago from Chicago that said, and it's a hard thing to hear, he said, the poor, you need the rich. They're going to help you lift you out of poverty. And rich, you need the poor. They'll lift you out of eternal damnation. I mean, that's a hard thing to tell somebody, right? But nonetheless, and there also has to be solidarity amongst the workers themselves, right? So nothing's going to drive you more nuts than when you go and work someplace and you have the slacker brown noser who gets paid the same as you do and does half the work but never gets called out. But you might, you might as well get used to that right now, because it's going to happen. But that breaks down solidarity, doesn't it? And by the way, that's usually an employer's fault. You know, an employer needs to see that stuff. Um, there has to be a solidarity between employers and employees. So the hat factory that I told you about, the Catholic Church is, is huge on, like, um, uh, in, like, let's say, credit unions or... Um, or co-op businesses, right? Or sometimes you could do that like, you. there's like co-op farms. You can go there and pay a certain amount to get free vegetables, well not free, you pay throughout the year. Or you can invest in your time and it reduces your cost. Things like that, you know, this, this, this uh, what do you want to say, this, just this cooperativeness between people, right? That's necessary. Those are good things. Um, and employers and employees, this is why we have unions. Is the Catholic Church for unions? Yes. Because without unions, employees would get crushed. Even in a Catholic school, without a union, an employee would get crushed. Now, before you think, oh, there you go with the Democrat again, you're also going to have to know they have a problem with some unions who seek only a higher pay and better benefits for their, their employees and don't take into regard the industry that they're in or the market. And if you want an example of that, just think of any of the steel plants in Bethlehem that are no longer there. You can keep forcing and forcing employers to pay until they can't do it anymore. Next thing you know, guess what plant went to Mexico? You know? So there's a balance. There's always a balance, right? Do you have a question? No. No? There also has to be solidarity between peoples within a nation, which we are totally lacking today. And you could probably do your part just by not being a purveyor of um, fake or rake news, right? You're going to pass something along on Twitter or Facebook or wherever. Would it be that hard to read the article and research it first before you shoot it off? Probably not, but that would help, right? Um, and we're also going to start looking at, stop looking at people that are enemies that disagree with us, right? And again, I know that this is really easy now with Trump. We get the picture of what's going on. But you guys, you know, it's not your fault that you're not born earlier, but 10 years ago, there was equal um, animosity towards Barack Obama, but people didn't agree with him. It wasn't a media frenzy like it is today, but nonetheless, people, you know, have to move beyond the fact that you disagree with me, therefore, you're not thinking, you're, you're an idiot that can't think. We have to get beyond that, right? And that's what the dialectic was supposed to try to show. You have to have a peaceful, re, you know, reasonable dialogue. And also between nations, right? So we could talk about trade issues. Uh, you guys know the term banana republic. It's a very easy illustration. So post-colonial parts of the world, you know, we don't really have an industry. We'll set them up. They wind up with one product. 
could be bananas, that's where the word came from, and that's their export. So all they can do is export bananas. But since they need to import everything else, the more powerful countries have them. If you want to import this stuff, then you've got to drive the price down on that. I mean, they have no, what leverage they have? None. That breaks down solidarity. And then we'll see on Monday, when you drive this to its natural end and all this fails, guess why we go to war? People don't go to war simply because they didn't like the hair color of the people on the other side of the, of the boundary. All right? It's not how it works. There's other things that happen, right? So in the end, this is what world peace depends on, solidarity between individuals. Um, but you can, there are laws that can help with this, right? I mean, people might say, why does the state have certain powers? Well, because individuals cannot regulate the pharmaceutical industry. If there was a pharmaceutical drug that was showing to have side effects or dangerous to individuals, I don't think we can get together as citizens of Reading and fight that. You need a bigger organization. Right, um, banking industry. We like the fact that our banks are insured, you know, through the federal government. Why? Because Boyne ain't going to do it. <laughs> okay. So we need we need it on all levels. But our work and this works on a national level too. Uh, the Declaration of hum, you know Universal Human Rights. Are we going to recognize that there are human rights that all people are have legitimate reasons to? Are we going to are we going to talk about refugees? You know, what right does a refugee have to flee a dangerous state? You know, so all those things become solidarity. We can work out the details. That's not what we're talking about now, right? Anyway. Which you never hear in a conversation. Even today, and I don't really agree with what's going on with the immigration, but it'd be nice to start from the beginning and saying, what reason do people have the right to immigrate? And what rights does a country have to limit who may or may not come? You know, if we started a, a dialectic on that, we'd probably find out we're not that far apart, but we, we're not very good at that. Okay, so we're now we're going to talk about equality and differences. And if it seems like that's an odd thing to state, we're going to show how we're all equal, and that is so important. And then we're going to show how we're all different, and that is equally important, not to be punny, all right? So the equality of all men, this really rests on the dignity of persons and the rights that flow from that, right? And the rights that flow from that. So as a human person, we have you know, an immeasurable dignity. And there are rights that flow from that that you cannot take away, right? So um, even people who abuse the system, okay? So I had, like, I'll give you a for instance. Um, I had a neighbor who was on total disability and he'd walk back and forth to the post office with a cane. And if you saw him on the street, you'd feel quite bad. I did. Until I saw him when summer came, each week. Now, you have to understand, the hill beyond their house and my house is like, it's like 30, 35 degree incline. You're, you need to be a mountain goat. You can't use a lawnmower. He weed whacked it. it. Took him six hours. And then I seen him go up to the house, put the weed whacker down, get the cane, and went. Okay? Now, that's, something's wrong with that. If I knew what number to call, I would call. That's an abuse, right? The same thing why, like on the good side though, aren't we glad that there's disability insurance? My father's a disability. He could not work. If there wasn't disability insurance, I don't even know what we would have done. We'd have been homeless, right? So do you see the balances between all these things? It's the same thing with unemployment insurance. Thank God when some, you know, by the way, your employer pays that, not really you. What you would invest in that when you're an employee is like a penny. Um, but when you're let go, that you have something there to tide you over. But on the other hand, in 2008, when the economy went south, they extended unemployment insurance for up to two years. I knew people, I won't mention the name, that were fired, and I felt terrible for them. One, because it was right before Christmas, and I thought that was horrible that an employer would do that. But he didn't care. As a matter of fact, he wasn't looking for a job for at least a year, because he has two years to worry about. That's a problem, right? Do you see how, you know, all the solidarity and stuff between us? So, but that being said, in any of those instances, I don't care if you are a drug user on welfare, the two things that, that have to be provided for you is shelter and food. I mean, because you're still human. You're not an animal, even if you can't take care of yourself. And that's because all men have the same nature and origin. We all have the same nature and origin. So that would kind of answer your question there as to our nature, right? And we're all created in God's image. Even the atheist who shoots somebody because he wanted their sneakers. 
he still has dignity. You can't, it's, it, it's immeasurable, and it's, you can't transfer it, right? So therefore, our equality amongst us has to be recognized. So anything that breaks down equality has to be ferreted out. That means every form of social or cultural discrimination, right? Because by the way, discrimination is not a bad thing. If somebody says you shouldn't discriminate, oh yes you should. I, I'm pretty sure you picked who you went to prom with, and I'm pretty sure the colleges that you wanted to go to discriminated in order for you to get in. Why? They give you a 1.8, they're not letting you in. Okay. What we don't discriminate on is on social, and cultural, and racial grounds, right? That's what we don't discriminate. Okay. It, discrimination is incompatible with God's design, right? So we are all equal. It doesn't matter who's smarter here than the other one. It doesn't matter who's faster, who's brighter, who's healthier. What does discrimination mean? Well, discrimination just means that you are choosing. You know, I mean, if you think about it, if you have a discriminating, if you have discriminating taste, you don't eat anything. You eat something that's good. So, you know, colleges, do colleges discriminate? I hope so, <laughs> you know? Otherwise, first of all, you need a high school diploma. That'd be the first thing. Is that discrimination? Well, yes. It's not discrimination based on race, creed, or culture. I mean, race, creed, or color, all right? Uh, now, differences. We don't like to talk about differences because we think we're all equal. We think somehow talking about differences says we're not equal. That's <laughs> not how it works. Differences are actually part of God's plan, okay? They're actually part of God's plan. So we shouldn't be shocked that he did not make us all the same. So, each is endowed with talents. And we're meant to share those benefits with others. We are meant to share those benefits with others. We're meant to share those benefits with others. Now, I'm not trying to pick on business people, but it's, just, it's an easy application of this. Some people are very savvy with making decisions in the market. In other words, they can invest and stuff. And there's a problem with that even ethically, okay? That, you know, we have shareholders as opposed to, you know, people that are more involved, right? Because a shareholder wants one thing, profit, right? But nonetheless, some of you might be very savvy with business. You were given that as a gift. Yes, you nurtured it. Yes, you probably went to college and learned more about it. But God did not give you that gift to make you filthy wealthy. He gave you that gift to give yourself a decent living and then take care of other people in terms of solidarity, all right? And you can't, a government can't force that. If you do, it's called communism, all right? The only way to make that happen is by individuals doing that on their own, all right? Which I'll give you an example in a little bit. Um, but nonetheless, that's important. So whatever talent, like, in other words, if you have a talent and you're very empathetic and you work well with others, maybe you're going to psychology, maybe you want to get into a field like my wife did, where you know, you're helping people get gainfully employed who otherwise wouldn't be able to get employed. She would go to the jobs with them, didn't matter if it was Wendy's or an office, she would learn their job and then train them to do the job, the development of the table. The problem is- Mr. Goss, please contact the main office. The problem is, is we hear a lot about mental illness in our world and that a lot of our problems have to deal with this, these people that create crimes or shoot. It's all talk. When my wife did that back in the early 90s with a master's degree, you started out 9.50 an hour. We hit a rough spot not too many years ago. She looked to get back in the field. It's up to 10 and a quarter. You know, think of that. So anybody that says they're serious about it, it's <coughs> politicians talking, right? Nobody's going to change it. Anyway, these differences, and this is why they're there, these differences encourage us, and they often oblige us, and I got a few things here. They often oblige us to practice generosity. So these differences encourage and they often oblige us to practice uh, generosity, kindness, and the sharing of the goods. They encourage us and oblige the person to practice generosity, kindness, and sharing of the goods. If we don't recognize that, if we think, hey, man, do I have a knack for making money, but I have a knack for selling houses, right? Like, I, I'm telling you, I know I'm a little hard on this. I have a problem when organizations, like a group of guys, will go in and buy these houses that they're foreclosed on for like $45,000, do nothing but patch the cement and then turn around and sell them for eighty-five. dollars I talk to some people. They put, my neighbors, they, they did it to my neighbors. I said, why can't you just, like help people out. Well, we're in this to make money. 
but those poor people couldn't even afford it. Why can't you just sell it to them for 60? You're still making 15, for God's sakes. This is a problem. A government can't step in and do that, right? So there must not be excessive economic and social disparity between individuals and peoples. There must not be excessive economic and social disparity between individuals and peoples. Now, again, if you think that, that, that I'm espousing socialism or communism, you're missing it. Yes? Uh, can you define economic disparity? Well, you know, you can't have, okay, I, 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 this is an extreme example. You know, when you have a CEO go into St. Joe's Hospital in Lancaster, but they turned it over to a community college, and he's making three and a half million dollars a year and they have to let go X number of people that are making, you know, 30 some thousand dollars a year. You know, how do you justify that? Except through saying, well, he's very good at what he does. You know, there's such a large economic disparity. And, by, and tomorrow, actually, you know what? Let me leave it to tomorrow, because tomorrow I'm gonna show you graphs. I'm gonna show you graphs in the United States and the world on how these economic disparities have grown. Even as, you know, like from 1979, what, how has the gap between rich and poor grown? And why did that happen? But, so, is, I still don't understand. What exactly do you mean by economic Oh, disparity? okay, well, I know this sounds cliche, but we're in a situation where the rich has gotten richer and the poor are stagnant. You know, and there, there's, in, there's instituted mechanisms in our country that have allowed that, right? I'm trying to say that's breaking down these. That's breaking down solidarity. Just hold off to tomorrow because I think tomorrow I could put it in a different context for you. All right. All I'm saying is this becomes the source of scandal, and it militates. Let's just say it militates against peace on many levels. I'm good at that, and I got one example for you. It militates against peace on many examples. Yeah. So listen, though, because now I can put this into context for you. Here's how the Catholic Church would love to see a business venture go forward. There was a doctor in India who would give cataract surgery. That's a big problem in that country. It's a leading source of blindness. The lenses, and he needed two, were costing him $100 a piece. So what he would do is he would, he would um, see four or five paying patients, and he would reserve some of their profit, there's nothing wrong with profit, and then he would see one, he would give one person who couldn't afford it for free with the monies he made. That's pretty noble. There was a, an entrepreneur from the United States who had a terminal um, disease and he wanted to do something good and lasting. He met this doctor and the doctor said, do you think you can produce the lenses for me? And the guy said, well, I don't know anything about it, but I'm an entrepreneur, I'll figure it out. He found out, guess how much those lenses cost that he was, he was, he had, he was buying for $100. They were costing him, they were not costing him, they were cost one dollar a piece to make. So this entrepreneur said, all right, I'll make them for you. Because I now that I know they make one, they only cost a dollar, I'll make them for a dollar and I'll sell them to you for four bucks. That way I'm making four hundred percent profit and you're saving ninety-six bucks on every lens you buy. All right? Um, the shorter story was the guy, he asked the guy to move the place right there. That's, a, that's another, right next to his, his clinic, but that's another side story. Now, what would some doctors, I'm not, I don't mean doctors, what would some business people do? They used to be paying $100 each for their product. Now they're getting it for $4. Why can't they just sell it to the guy for $55 and they're still making, their, they've been making a lot more money. That guy didn't do it. It's called the Himalayan Cataract Project, by the way. What that guy did was he said, all the money that I'm saving, now for every three people that have to pay, I'm giving two to three people free eyesight. No government can make that happen. When a government comes in and forces that, it, it, it's almost communism, right? But there's nothing, you can't do that. It takes the individual to transform, right? Anyway, I have another story you have to ask me tomorrow if we have time.